we're going to go ahead and just jump down to cost recovery, uh, which will be item 6-1 under new business. Um, Rochelle, you want to talk to us? Yes, I would love to. Um, so tonight with us, we have Jamie Sabah, who um, she's the president and CEO of 110%. And her business partners with Amelia Enterprise, and she is the consultant that we're working with to go through the smart approach to financial sustainability, or as we know, um, cost recovery work. And um, I have had the like the privilege of working with Jamie um, over a series of years, and um, Jamie is nationally recognized for the work that she does in cost recovery. And it's just it's an honor working with her. And um, part of the reason that she's here tonight is to talk to the board and educate the board about cost recovery. And so we're gonna learn a little bit about it. And then the fun part is we'll all be speaking the same language and then we get to take that information and have a joint work session November 21st with the council to set our beneficiary services, which we're going to learn about today from Jamie. And um, so I guess without further ado, Jamie, I'll, I'll absolutely toss it over to you and, and thank you for being here tonight. Yeah, well, Rochelle, thank you for obviously the opportunity to uh, be here this evening with the board. Uh, board members appreciate your time and attention this evening as well. Um, as Rochelle mentioned, I'm going to provide you a rather high level overview of the uh, the concepts of cost recovery as they relate specifically to public park and recreation systems. Um, I'm going to share with you and bear with me as I uh, share my screen. Uh, Rochelle, I'll need somebody to uh, allow me to uh, share my screen on this end, if you don't mind. Yes, I can do that for you right now. Um, I'm going to spend about approximately 50 minutes or so sharing some content, but I am going to um, pause a couple of times throughout the, the presentation to see if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments that you'd like to share. Um, and uh, hopefully we will have um, some robust discussion. And if you don't have questions throughout um, and you prefer to hold those until the end, your thoughts, comments, questions, uh, that's absolutely fine as well. But um, I certainly don't want this to feel as though it's very much a one-way uh, conversation. So again, I will I will hit pause a couple of times. So um, as Rochelle mentioned, we refer to this process as the uh, smart approach to financial sustainability. There was a day and time when we called this the smart approach to cost recovery. And frankly, um, we have so many people that conflate cost recovery with things that it is not, that we felt it critically important um, and, and really pivotal in the effectiveness of this work to begin to think about it in a broader sense. And it really is about creating financially sustainable systems. Think about it in terms of fiscal health and well-being, uh, being able to, to write the bills or uh, uh, pay the bills and write the checks, if you will. So I'm gonna be sharing with you just a few things tonight uh, to whet your appetite, hopefully uh, give you a, a broader and, and a deeper sense of what uh, the organization is in the midst of right now and what your role will be in this process moving forward, your critical component to this effort as representative community members. So I'm gonna to touch on just a few things this evening. Again, we'll have about 50 minutes of content and depending on how robust our conversation is relative to your thoughts, perspectives, questions, comments, um, you know, we may gravitate towards that hour time frame. Um, but I'm going to set the stage with why this is such an incredibly important exercise in public parks and recreation, and frankly, in government as a whole. Um, we focus on public park recreation and what we call quality of life services, like libraries. Um, but we'll set the stage with the why. And then I'm going to hit pause, as I mentioned, and see if you have any thoughts, comments, questions that you'd like to share. Um, and then I'm going to dive into and kind of part two, the what and how. Um, essentially sharing with you the methodology that we've been privileged to uh, use with a number of organizations across the United States over the last 10 years. Um, we've actually worked with 80 organizations just in the last two years to create financial sustainability strategies. I think it speaks to the importance of this work in this moment in time and um, also the fact that we're seeing more gravitational pull towards understanding the importance of financial sustainability in our systems today. Things have just simply changed as it relates to uh, economic conditions and our reliance on taxpayer dollars as we once had. Um, then I'll uh, pause again for final thoughts, comments, questions, and then I'll share with you as we close tonight what next steps uh, look like in the process. And Rochelle, of course, if at any point in time along the way you'd like to interject and um, kind of embellish on a point, please feel free to do so. Um, so I'm going to set the stage with this, and I, I probably should have uh, spent just a moment doing a bit of a brief introduction of myself, um, but I've spent over 30 years 
in the park and recreation profession, either as practitioner or um, as I serve today as an advisor consultant, and I actually also teach in higher education. Um, and uh, I think with that has come certainly personal experiences as an administrator, um, but also, frankly, uh, we have learned a lot. We've observed a lot, having the opportunity to work with so many professionals representing so many agencies in the country about what their biggest pain points are, what are the greatest concerns in communities, um, what are the, the commonalities in terms of their concerns and their, their anxieties, frankly, um, relative to doing the good work that they're expected to do for their communities. Um, and so we have created a process, frankly, that um, we've even evaluated in terms of effectiveness through Penn State University. And so we're proud of this work, uh, proud to work alongside folks like uh, Rochelle and her entire team. Um, but with that, um, it's important, again, that we really understand why this is so critically important today. And, and I'm going to share with you uh, some rather high level um, insights relative to the whys behind financial sustainability work. Um, I will share just a, a bit of context. Uh, this is probably going to be the, the, the shortest, briefest hip history lesson you've ever had. And this is where the, the academic, uh, academician in me comes out. But I think it's important to understand our foundations. It's like anything else. You know, history really is our greatest teacher. And the foundations of public parks and recreation started in this space. Um, some people think it was the National Park Service or Central Park. In actuality, it was Boston Commons. And I, I think there is something profound in this because we think about commons today. You know, how do we affect the commons? How do we influence the commons? How do we impact the commons? You know, the greater good, the common good. And our birthplace as a profession was a public space. It, it wasn't a yoga class. It wasn't a rec center. It wasn't a playground. It was a common space with the intention of it being this common space where people would gravitate and self-direct their own activity. Now, we also recognize there were many people that were disenfranchised, marginalized, who didn't have access. At the same time, this was a space where, again, we weren't providing services. We were facilitating by way of providing a space for people to recreate on their own or you know, leisure activity. But the important thing here is that we understand that over a number of years, centuries, we rather quickly became a profession of something for everyone all the time. It came down to our taxpayers suggesting that if they wanted something, we would react and respond because we wanted to satisfy their interests. And what it has led us to become is a profession, again, of something for everyone all the time. And now understanding that our fiscal resources, our staff resources, our infrastructure is not necessarily able to, in many cases, handle the expectation. So we now find ourselves in a place to say, okay, what is our lane as a public sector institution, as an entity, understanding there are other providers in our communities, other public sector providers, nonprofits, private uh, providers, providing similar and like services to, to public parks and recreation. And given our resources, given what we have available today, how do we best use those in order to have the greatest impact on our community as a whole? So we're really charged and challenged with a very provocative and very profound question. And we're really at a tipping point in terms of our world is how do we again invest and spend the taxpayer dollars we're privileged to be the stewards of spending and investing in such a way that we have the greatest impact on the community. So it's a bit of a, a lesson for us, certainly. In addition, I think it's important um, to this exercise that I, I share with you a, a couple of very brief research studies that that um, again are a bit profound in terms of what they taught us just a few years ago and the irony um, as we connect the dots between then and now. Um, there's a professor at Penn State University, his name's Dr. Andy Mowen, and Andy actually spent almost two decades in the public park and recreation profession as a practitioner. He uh, gravitated towards higher education and he's one of the few academicians in the United States who actually studies and researches management and administration of park and rec systems. And he wanted to do a couple of studies back in 2016, 2017, as they related to the impacts of the last recession on the profession. So what was the great recession's impacts on public parks and recreation? Think back to 2007, eight, nine. And so the first thing he did was he did a bit of research and he dove into what was the public, public sector P&L, right? What was our balance sheet um, as, a, as a sector? And it was rather disturbing. As you can see, we were overexpending. We're spending more than we're bringing in. If we're the federal government, we can print money. We can't do that at the local and state level. And we all, I think, would recognize, and I think we would all agree, that if this was our personal checkbook, we'd have to take some corrective action. So this really set the stage for him to move forward in terms of his research and evaluation and begin to kind of understand 
what was the recession's impact on our profession and what might it look like as we move forward? There were a couple of images that I'm gonna share with you this evening that I use often. I've been using them for the last few years because I think they speak volumes. But I mentioned uh, one of the two studies he did, uh, he titled The Great Recession's Profound Impact on Parks and Recreation. And if you feel so inclined, you can actually Google this and get a little bit more information than, than I'm, what I'm going to be able to share with you this evening based on time. So Andy and his uh, team of graduate assistants really dove into um, the details. They wanted to understand how are public park and rec systems being impacted and affected as a result of the last recession. So I'm gonna share two graphs with you, or two images rather. The first is really interesting. It's a kind of overarching image uh, that's representative of our spending between the years 89 and 2013. And I think Rochelle's probably heard me say this before, but um, I started my career in public parks and recreation in 89 as a sports program coordinator in Illinois with a special district. And so it's a little bit of a walk down memory lane for me. And I think back to uh, kind of the glory days, if you will. But between 89 and 2003, we as a profession at the local level expended 63.3% more between 1989 and 2003. And between 03 and 2008, we saw another 14.7% increase. So between 89 and 2008, over a 20 year period, we saw an increase of 80% um, in our spending patterns. You know, We saw a crazy amount of building in parks and recreation. This is when we started to see mega facilities being built. Uh, the state of Colorado, which is where I am today, um, this was the state that started to build 80, 90, 100,000 square foot facilities, these huge foyers. Um, and so we were investing a lot in parks and recreation, but what we weren't necessarily doing was thinking about the long-term consequences of our short-term satisfaction. We weren't thinking about taking care of those, the, that infrastructure. We just believed that the money would be there when the time came. And you can probably guess what happened in 2008. Again, uh, the Great Recession, 2007, 8, 9, we saw a decrease of 21%. Uh, but we also recognize that while our spending decreased by 21%, community expectations did not increase, but decrease by 21%. And this is where we started to coin, at least in our field, we saw this a lot in the private sector, but, um, you know, a lean organization, do more with less. And so it really began to kind of stretch the public park and recreation profession that had grown for decades and now is finding itself in a bit of a precarious situation. The other image I want to share with you is... Um, I'll say my favorite, but in kind of a strange way. Um, and this is relative to our total expenditures between 2000 and 2013. You can see that first bar graph in 2000, we uh, expended almost, well, $35.5 billion. But I'd like you to, to direct your attention to the blue and the red pieces of the bars. Um, in 2000, of that $35.5 billion expenditure, 66% of that was being directed to our operating budgets, right? The operating side of the fence while almost 34% was being directed to our capital. Think infrastructure, right? taking care of our assets. We move over to 2008. Again, we saw that escalation in terms of spending and expenditures. We were spending $40.7 billion, but you'll notice that we put more of that bucket into operating and less into our capital. And finally, if we look at 2013, we had a $32.5 billion expenditure as a profession, but we put more of that bucket in operating and significantly less in capital. It really speaks today to the fact that we've got an infrastructure crisis, not just at the federal level, not just with our roads and our bridges and our water, but if we think about it in a more granular way relative to our public park systems across the United States, we have an infrastructure crisis in public parks and recreation. And so there's a little bit of a lesson for all of us in this, in terms of the choices that we made in the moment relative to where we were putting the money, right? We were reinvesting and spending those taxpayer dollars. And today in some systems, they're really in crisis mode relative to taking care of their assets. We're waiting with bated breath for that last bar graph Andy has suggested. I actually saw him today, uh, believe it or not. And um, we're all, again, waited, waiting with bated breath to see what that last bar graph is going to look like. But all indications are that it's not going to look very good. We're actually going to see less of the bucket being directed to capital. So this does really beg the question for all of us, that, um, you know, how do we consider our choices relative to what is it we want to invest in and how do we want to impact the community as a whole? Um, and so these are, these are very revealing for us as a profession and then it really charges and challenges us to think about our spending investment choices. Alternatively, um, there are a number of, of uh, research studies and surveys that have been done over the last couple of years about what's been happening at the go in government levels, right? Local, state, federal. 
Uh, this one I thought was really interesting, came out um, a year and a half ago now uh, through our Inter International City County Management Association. And it was a survey uh, that they refer to as the state of local government survey, suggesting that seven out of 10 local governments were expecting to see moderate, significant, or major financial adjustments being needed, largely because of the pandemic. Um, but we also understand there's all kinds of other moving parts right now as well. Um, alternatively, you know, we think about what's happening today. If we pay attention to the news, we think about inflation. We think about inflation a little bit more often relative to our own pocketbooks rather than those of our systems. Um, park and rec systems, local governments have yet to see the impacts of inflation, uh, as particularly the systems that have fiscal years January, December. Uh, they're going to start to see those impacts. You know, something as simple as maybe a $10,000 food budget is going to cost us another thousand dollars. If you think about, you know, bigger systems that have maybe a hundred thousand dollar fuel budgets, uh, these are huge impacts that systems are going to be realizing. So there are a lot of things that are influencing and affecting the bottom line, if you will, of park and rec systems, affecting how we're going to be thinking about how we're going to choose to invest and spend those taxpayer dollars as we move forward. Alternatively, we have systems while um, you know some are struggling and they're concerned. We have others, frankly, that are uh, jumping on the bandwagon, if you will, on the train saying, you know what, we're okay right now, but we're going to stay that way. We understand the importance of this work. So we want to be a fiscally healthy organization. Um, I like to say not just for the citizens of 2022, but the citizens of 2050. What choices can we make now? What strategies can we employ? How can we be responsive to what's happening? so that we are taking care of our systems and we think about the legacy of our organizations rather than just this moment in time. We've got a number of other conditions um, and really, again, this just speaks to the complexity uh, of park and recreation systems. And while there's complexity around every system, and I understand that park and recreation systems have the most complex budgets within government, you know, or the systems that offer and provide programs and services for low income youth and families or people with disabilities, day camps, and we're also providing services that are enterprise in nature, like golf courses and water parks, and then everything in between. So there are a series of conditions that tend to influence and affect um, park and rec systems, I think in a more profound way at times. But we know there's a lot going on. Um, park and rec professionals right now in this moment in time have uh, you know a heavy load to bear. Um, there's a lot of economic uncertainty. I think everyone in the room, uh, myself included, we don't have a crystal ball. We have no idea what's going to happen. You listen to one economist and they tell you one thing and another the next day is saying something else. You just know there's uncertainty and some volatility. We know there's a public health crisis. We're, we're a profession that hangs our hat on being leaders in the United States relative to health and wellness and health and well-being. Yet we're dealing with a public health crisis relative to COVID, opioid, uh, use and addiction, diabetes, um, obesity, I mean, you name it. Um, social unrest and chaos, uh, clearly we've had a significant amount of that over the last couple of years. And, and yet it's been going on for a long time, right? The veil just um, uh, kind of was removed. We know that over the last couple of years, again, another veil has been removed relative to increasing disparities and needs. You know, who are those underrepresented, underserved, marginalized, invisible populations in our communities that we've yet to reach? Um, a lack of revenue diversification. We found that over the last few years, again, veil came off, we looked under the hood and realized so many systems were so dependent on taxpayer resources that if you know, their property tax assessments declined or something else happened where their general fund was really taxed, it was gonna have huge implications on their systems. Um, we've acknowledged and recognized, and I'm again, I have a 30 plus year professional who was a practitioner and now I serve the profession differently. We've got limited financial literacy in our profession and I'm gonna, uh, take this moment to uh, celebrate your staff, uh, Rochelle, uh, John, the entire gang uh, really dove into this exercise, committed to um, enhancing their business acumen through this work. So it's refreshing to work with an organization that understands the importance of this stuff and really become role models for the rest of our profession. Uh, maintenance backlogs, I touched on this briefly. You know, we have systems across the country now with a billion dollars in maintenance backlog. City of Austin, Texas, one of the more prolific systems over the last three decades, just a year ago, announced that they have a billion dollars in maintenance backlog just in parks and recreation. 50 aquatics facilities, average age 50 years, and they have just continued to dismiss the importance of investing in those assets. Keep building, growing, growing, growing. Now they serve a population over 2 million people and they can barely pay the bills. Um, we have a lot of uninformed constituents in our communities. Well, it's no one's fault. It's unintentional, but many community members just simply think my taxes pay for everything and they don't really understand the complexities around what their taxpayer dollars go towards and what they may not. That 
can sometimes connect to unreasonable expectations. Again, simply by virtue of paying taxes, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that local government can give you everything you want and more. Um, across the profession, we have major staffing deficiencies. Um, you know, one of the biggest areas of, that's been hit have been our pools across the country. Uh, a lot of folks can't find lifeguards. They've actually shuttered their pools. Um, some are actually converting their pools into spray grounds and splash pads with the expectation they're never going to be able to get the guards on deck like they used to. Um, it's struggling competitors and communities. You know, our partners, people in the, you know, in the nonprofit or private sector who we have relied on to help us provide services and communities have gone out of business or they've been impacted tremendously by the last couple of years. And if it's a private sector business in particular, we have to be very cautious because we understand if they close their doors permanently, it dilutes the very tax base upon which we're dependent. So again, there's complexities around these, but the important thing is not to just focus on all, you know, doom and gloom, and this is grim reaper-esque. It's simply that we need to be eyes wide open. We need to understand this is the stuff that we're faced with in this moment in time so that it helps us create an informed and very intelligent strategy. We can't dismiss it. We just need to embrace it and understand that we're going to have to react and respond a bit differently than we have in the past. So it leads us to this type of work, and we like to brand it under this umbrella of Parks and Economics. We coined this a couple of years ago, and very simply what this means to us and, and what we articulate to those we work with and alongside is challenging us to think about how do we best manage our finite resources in this moment in time. Again, I mentioned earlier, we're privileged to be stewards of taxpayer dollars. Every day we make choices on their backs. We, we make choices to spend and invest their money and so how are we doing that? What philosophies are we following? You know, what strategies are we employing to ensure that we're doing this in the most responsible way? So we like to set the stage with this idea of, are you smart about managing money? Um, and really that's what this is all about. Um, it's a bit of a rhetorical question. And at the same time, we ask folks to be serious and thinking about it. And we're clearly not talking about the personal checkbooks here, but are you smart, intelligent? Are, are you making defensible decisions with other people's resources? And a couple of things that are very important to this exercise are understanding some basic nomenclature, some basic terms that, that are a huge part of this process. Um, cost recovery is one of them. I mentioned that on the very front end, you know, what is cost recovery? And we have, unfortunately in our profession, um, got, we're in our own way oftentimes when it comes to cost recovery. We think about this through a negative lens of, it's just about raising fees, it's pricing people out of the market, we're just trying to get rid of services. And that couldn't be any further from the truth. Cost recovery very simply is understanding what it costs us to provide services and then making some intelligent decisions and creating a philosophy around what recovery percentages do we need to have based upon what's available to us. So it's recovering or offsetting the costs associated with delivering services. In some cases, we might say, we're not gonna recover anything. Maybe it's for, you know by way of our public parks. Alternatively, we may say, well, it's responsible for us to recover this percentage or maybe more by virtue of the type of service it is and who benefits from it, how accessible um, it is and so on. Alternatively, the other side of the coin, of course, is subsidy and very simply that's taxpayer dollars. Um, sometimes subsidy gets a bad rap. We think about it um, again, a bit negatively and subsidy just simply is a benefit given by government. It's taxpayer dollars that are distributed. The intention is they're distributed to remove a burden. Um, and it's intended to also be in the overall interest of the public or the common good or social good. That's not always the case. And so this exercise in and of itself really tests organizations to ask the question, where are we putting our subsidy? Are we gifting it just because of, uh, we've always gifted it this way? Or are we really gifting it in a way that it is going to have a big influence on the, so the common good or the social good? Is it really removing a burden? Is it creating equitable uh, access to our services and so on? So this process very simply is about connecting reality with policy. Sandy's reality is different than Portland's reality is different than Boulder, Colorado's reality is different than Austin, Texas, and so on as story goes. So working alongside staff, um, they understand the realities in the system. Having the opportunity to have FaceTime with all of you, you understand the realities in Sandy, Oregon. And what we're um, hoping to do and expecting to do is help create a financial sustainability strategy and policies that connect to your realities in Sandy, Oregon. While we have a methodology that we follow, this is certainly not a one size fits all approach. One more thing I'll share, and then I'm gonna hit pause for a couple of minutes and see if you have any thoughts, comments, questions. Um, we who have served this profession and, and those who continue to serve this profession um, in the vast majority of cases have big social service hearts. 
we wear rose-colored glasses, we want to do right by communities, we want to give to communities. Um, and what we need to do more than ever in, in this moment in time is balance that with business acumen, being very smart and intentional and thoughtful about how we are spending investing these resources. Um, it's a balancing act and it's a tough one. And one of the things I think we always have to come back to is that in order to honor the social uh, purpose, right, the social service purpose that we have in parks and recreation, we've got to be able to, again, write the checks. We've got to be able to ensure that the resources are there to provide the critical services our communities need of us in this moment. That may not be everything, but there are certainly services that Park and Rec Systems provide today that are absolutely critical and essential. If we think back to the last couple of years, our public parks were that in every community across the country. It was an escape. It was a, a, a safety net for many. Um, so we're right now, you know, as we go through these exercises, we're really helping organizations um, create that balance. Again, the business acumen with uh, the purpose around social service. So I'm gonna hit pause and see if you have any thoughts, comments, questions relative to what we again like to refer to as the why. This is such an important uh, effort today. All right, hearing none, I will uh, get back. I think the silence means we've all bought into it, okay? <laughs> Say that again? I said silence means we've all bought in. Excellent, all right, good. Compelling. Yeah. All right, let's get back to it. So this is, uh, this part of uh, the content this evening is really to share with you how this process works. And uh, the staff have, um, um, participated in a number of workshops, really dug deep to understand the methodology. Uh, they're actively involved in this exercise right now. Um, but we use what we refer to very simply as a three-legged stool approach. It's the methodology we've been using for the last few years. We're proud to say we're constantly trying to improve it. Um, but it's a rather simplified way of thinking about how to create uh, a tax investment and revenue enhancement philosophy, AKA a financial sustainability strategy. You know, how do we invest and spend those taxpayer dollars in the most responsible way? And how do we think about revenue enhancement opportunities when we have them available to us? Uh, many systems today cannot continue to rely on the general fund the way that they have um, or as they have historically. So they're being um, charged and challenged to think about revenue enhancement opportunities to reinvest in their own systems, whether it's in a service that provides greater access and equity whether it's a, a you know infrastructure investment that needs to be made to avoid it becoming um, you know a deferred maintenance um, item in the system, so this uh, greater self reliance has become something that park and rec systems are are um, expecting uh, to become in in uh, the U S. So this three legged stool very simply um, includes uh, the creation of service categories you see it on the left. In the middle, a beneficiary of service exercise, and on the right, a cost of service analysis. And I'm going to break these down uh, one at a time this evening, so you're familiar with what each of these is um, and and how important they are to the development of a strategy. So let's start with service categories. Um, I think it's important to start with you know, what is a service first. So, so really, there's a line in the sand and a delineation between a service, a service area, and a service category. So bear with me as I, I walk you through these. Um, so we think about a service in parks and recreation, just simply think about it as an experience that's provided by uh, the department, uh, a leisure experience. So leisure is the overarching umbrella under which things like uh, play and recreation and sports all fall. So you all have leisure time, you have discretionary time. Um, and this department provides activities, courses, classes, events, rentals uh, for people to uh, access and participate in during their leisure time. So it's any kind of leisure experience that's offered by the organization. That's a service. We think about a service area. Service areas simply are a very conventional, traditional way that we have organized our systems. Um, we have things like an aquatics division. Uh, we have parks divisions. We have uh, events divisions. We have sports divisions. We have youth divisions. These are very, again, common uh, types of areas or service areas within public park and recreation systems and library systems as well. Service areas are where likeness of service is the consideration for how we coordinate. 
Um, so on the left, you see three representative examples of what might be an aquatics area in an organization. On the top left, let's assume for a moment that's a, an aqua size, an intro to aqua size class for older adults. Let's assume in the middle there, you've got to learn to swim programs for some youngsters. And on the bottom left, of course, we have an aquatics facility. Let's say that's a spray ground and it's a, a pretty nice water park. They're all part of our aquatics division or our service area of aquatics. When we think about categorization, it's different. What we now do is we bucket our services based upon like purpose. So on the left, we see three examples of different type, types of services that actually are gonna be different service areas. In the top left, again, you see the carryover. That's an, uh, let's say it's an intro to an aqua size program for older adults, it falls in aquatics. Uh, in the middle, let's assume that's a, an atom level uh, flag football program for youngsters that's in our sports area. And then on the bottom left, the service is an intro to pottery class that it might be in our, our arts division, our cultural arts area. So they're all different services. They appeal to different markets, um, yet they're all like purpose because they're introducing um, someone to a skill. Um, they're teaching a brand new skill to someone. So the like purposes, they're beginner level types of activities. So that would be the category. Now, why would we consider categorization in uh, financial sustainability exercise? Why is it important? Well, there's two principal reasons, and this really has become a differentiator in our profession over the last couple of decades. We used to create cost recovery goals based upon service area. And you can imagine the social uh, values debates around whether seniors was more important than youth sports, was more important than this area, was more important than this area. So the two principal reasons we create categories are number one, it eliminates um, this opportunity for us to create arbitrary goals based upon an individual activity or service, like just pulling numbers out of the air and saying, oh, well, youth sports is really important in our community because it contributes to the physical health and well-being of our children. Well, so do so many other activities. Alternatively, it discourages attempts to make cost recovery decisions based upon special interests or social values. We now have things like a pottery class, a sport program, and an aquatics uh, service all in the same category. Because what we're saying is it's based on the purpose of the activity and the purpose of the exercise. So categorization has been a huge differentiator for our profession in terms of effectiveness of financial sustainability and or cost recovery strategies. Let me give you a very concrete example. Um, and this is simply that, it's just an example. I'm using three recreation activities as the example, not to um, diminish the importance of the park side of the fence here, but this is just to illustrate uh, what a category or uh, what a service category is in contrast to a service or a service area. So you see three different kinds of activities here on the bottom. I'm on the left, let's say that young man is in our T-ball program and that T-ball program is a service that lives within the service area of U Sports. We've also in the middle got a, a, a little boy who's in our learn to swim program. That's the service that happens to be in our aquatic service area. And finally on the right, let's say we have some older adults who are participating in intro to fitness class. That's the service and they happen to be in the seniors area. Well, again, how we have thought about cost recovery has been driven largely based on um, social values, uh, perspectives and opinions. We might say on the left, well, youth sports is really important in our community and people really like it. And maybe the mayor is the president of the local Little League and we need to be really careful about what we charge. So we're going to keep youth sports at 50%. And in the middle, we might say, well, um, you know, learn to swim. It's a value in our community and everybody should learn to swim. So we're going to have the cost recovery a little bit lower. And on the right, well, seniors vote and seniors have paid taxes their whole lives. And well, we're going to keep the cost recovery really low because we don't want to upset them. And I'm being obviously very facetious here. But this is how we have, in many cases, established cost recovery expectations. And we understand that there's a bit of a pitting against one another happening here unintentionally. You know, we're pitting sports against aquatics, against seniors. And what we're doing by virtue of these service categories is we're flipping the script. We're saying, all right, these services, while they do, again, serve a different interest, a different population might appeal to these particular services, we understand that every one of these is an intro, intro to intro kind of activity, right? A learn to kind of activity, a beginner level activity. We're teaching this young man the skill around baseball. We're teaching the young man in the middle skills around learning how to swim. And we're teaching these older adults how to ensure that they're staying engaged, you know, weightlifting or some kind of exercise program. They're all similar purpose and therefore they're likely going to be in the same category. And for example, we might have a category called beginner level activities. And what we will find then is they're likely all going to have the same cost recovery expectation because they're in the same service category. So 
John is actually leading the charge for your department relative to creating categories for Sandy, Oregon. I'm just sharing with you an example on the screen here of a series of categories for Corona, California. They actually just created their draft about a month ago. But, but John actually gave me on Friday the first draft. We're reviewing those as we speak. And so John and his team are creating categories to represent the service menu of Sandy, Oregon Park and Recreation Department. Um, the categories are intended to um, represent every service you provide. Uh, there are definitions to help clarify exactly what the category represents, and then actually including a series of examples to further clarify what the categories represent. So the, the intention is that it's explicitly clear what these categories are, what they mean, and what they represent. Uh, we're going to be using those with these with you during that joint session in November as we put you through an exercise that we refer to as the beneficiary of service. And that's where we find ourselves now. That second leg of the stool is the beneficiary of service work. And what we're going to do now is connect the dots between the categories and who it is that benefits in your community by these services or through these services. To give an example of what beneficiary of service is and why it's so important, um, again, a little bit of a walk down memory lane for us. Um, we have, over time, again, established goals based upon service areas. So let's assume uh, for the purposes of um, our time together this evening that we've got a, a, a service area in our system called aquatics. We have a service area you know, in our organization that's aquatics, and we've set a goal of 75 percent. But we, have a, we understand we have a number of different services that are aquatic services. We have things like learn to swim programs and we may have things like master swimming. And if we really look at these services and we really dig deep, we understand that there could be some challenges with us justifying the fact that both of these kinds of services would have the same expectation. And the principal reason is we begin to ask ourselves who's benefiting and who has access to these services. If we think about a learn to swim program, you could suggest that a majority of your community would have access, whether or not they choose to participate is another story. But skill and ability is not a restriction, that's right? It's not a constraint or a barrier to somebody participating. You know, I say this all the time, a little self-deprecation here. I don't like to swim. I don't like water. I'm not a good swimmer. I could participate in a learn to swim program and I'm in my 50s. A little boy on the screen, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old can participate as well. Um, so it's a greater, it's, it's a more accessible service. Alternatively, on the right, Master Swim Team, while really wonderful, is highly competitive. Likely, you have to have a particular mastery of a skill or ability in order to participate. So it tends to be a little bit more exclusive, a little bit more specialized in nature. And therefore, we ask ourselves, well, who has access? And does one of these services lean more towards affecting the common good and have a greater impact on the commons? while the other is a little bit more individualized and a little bit more specialized. And this allows us to begin to think about where is it we should be investing our taxpayer resources. We're likely gonna see services within the same service areas being in different categories. So for example, again, the Learn to Swim program, we're probably going to see in a beginner level activities category. And alternatively, in an organization where there's a master swim team, that's likely going to be in a category that's gonna be something like a competitive level category. And ultimately, we're going to see that those cost recovery expectations are going to be different. What you're going to be helping create, once those categories are developed, uh, John and team finish those up, and we've got a solid working draft. When you all come back and visit with me, along with your council uh, colleagues in November, uh, I'm going to be putting you through an exercise we very simply refer to as the beneficiary of service exercise. And I'm going to give you some instructions, and you're going to be ranking the department's categories from those you believe align more with the common good, common good definition being more essential, meaning must have services, services that have a community-wide um, impact, there's community-wide interest, uh, there's universal value, and there's access for all to those services that you believe are more individualized, right? They're more discretionary, uh, meaning those services that are nice to have. So there's more of a self-interest, there's limited community impact, they tend to be more exclusive, and access is limited, um, so there's more constraints and barriers to participation. Once you rank those categories, along with your colleagues on the council, we'll also be doing the same exercise with staff. You're going to then see the first iteration of your financial strategy, financial sustainability strategy come to life. We're going to be plotting your categories on that continuum. And you'll notice that those services on the left then would receive greater subsidy than those services in the top right, which would uh, reasonably receive less subsidy and potentially even be expected to, to generate excess revenues 
that you could reinvest back into the park and recreation system. Finally, the last leg of the stool, and please understand we're already doing this work, so they're not, this is not necessarily a linear process, is what we simply refer to as the cost of service analysis. And this is where we're working with your staff to collect all revenues and expenditures, including and on up to your executive director, Rochelle's salary and benefits, because she's a cost of uh, doing business, in order to help you understand what it costs you to provide every single service in your system. Um, all expenditures and all revenues are accounted for. Um, I often use this as a bit of a metaphor. I probably should starting to wear on me. I've been saying it so long, but it gets an important message. Um, the public sector for many years has um, considered cost recovery as part of its you know, exercise as relative strategy. But unfortunately, we've only accounted for direct costs, or in some cases we account for some indirects, but not all. And what we unintentionally do is we don't tell the truth. And it's not, again, intentional, but we're not necessarily conveying the real cost of providing services. I liken this to a teenage driver. You know, all of you were likely teenage drivers. Some of you probably have teenage drivers or have had teenage drivers. We just had a couple in our household. Um, and I think we all would remember the time when we thought the only cost associated with operating a motor vehicle was gas. And we forgot about you know, the fact that we have to insure the car and we have to replace the tires and we have to put new windshield wipers on it and, and all of those expenses that we tend to not think about. And so it's a bit of a metaphor relative to how governments thought about cost recovery. But today there's, we're seeing a tipping point. We're seeing a shift and more governments are saying, we want to understand our costs associated with doing business. We want to understand the costs associated with service delivery so we can tell a more accurate story and clearly help ourselves make more intentional decisions about, again, where should we be putting our resources in order to have the greatest impact? So as we go through this process, working alongside your staff, um, and we get closer to the finish line relative to the cost of service analysis, we'll be having a meeting with the project team. We'll reveal the cost of service analysis results, which will allow them to see current cost of every performance for every service, every activity, course, class, rental, et cetera, in the system. We'll also provide some guiding principles relative to establishing goals so that they're not arbitrary in nature, as well as considering what your budget projections are looking like over the next year or two. And that will allow them to make some intelligent decisions about what your goals should be and could be for each of your categories. And what that allows us to do then is transform that beneficiary service model. It's just the ranking of the categories, including the cost recovery goals. It converts into your financial sustainability strategy. Share a couple of examples with you. Um, this one, of course, your executive director um, came from Oregon City. Uh, this is their uh, cost recovery uh, strategy, or as they have um, labeled it, a financial support and sustainability strategy. Organizations are being very creative in how they want to uh, brand this model so that it resonates internally as well as externally. But you can see the categories that were created for Oregon City Park and Recreation. They engage their staff as well as their advisories and policymakers in the exercise of plotting or ranking those categories. Ultimately, when their cost of service analysis was completed, they were able to see the data sets that allowed them to make informed decisions about what their goals should be uh, for each category. You'll also notice, and Rochelle certainly can speak to this, they made an, a, a decision to highlight subsidy rather than cost recovery. They felt like that was an important message to let the community know here's how we're investing your taxpayer dollars. And even if we do say the percentage, you know, the, the goal is cost recovery based, um, while it means the same thing, um, it can resonate a little differently if you see a subsidy goal in contrast to a cost recovery goal. And you can see Oregon City was rather um, a bit aggressive in their, their goals, particularly the top five, six categories are suggesting that we'll no longer subsidize those services because there's less reliance on the general fund and they understood they needed to be a little bit more self-reliant and they wanted to reinvest back in the system to address equity concerns in the community, to address infrastructure or concerns that they have. As another example, briefly, this is a, a special district in the North Shore of Chicago, the Shanahan Park District. Um, they too chose to call theirs a financial sustainability strategy. They did follow suit and chose to have subsidy goals. Uh, they did not want to say subsidy. They wanted to say subsidized, simply meaning the same thing, but it was a personal preference and choice in terms of the word choice that they selected. And you can see an even more um, aggressive or assertive approach here, five categories up. Uh, they're not subsidizing competitive activities all the way up to resale. 
Uh, this system really struggling from a tax perspective. Uh, special districts are heavily reliant on property taxes. Uh, property tax evaluations in the state of Illinois have declined significantly. And it's a system, again, that grew pretty quickly. It was rather affluent for many years. They've got a lot of infrastructure and they've not taken care of it. Uh, so they're wanting to be as self-reliant as they can in the, in the short term to be able to reinvest back in their own system. And they wanted to say very uh, directly um, and very boldly, our taxpayer dollars are going to go to those four services in the bottom left, open access, meaning their park system, their major community events, drop-in activities, and their basic instructional activities. And they felt everything else, they were competing with the private sector and the nonprofit sector, and they didn't feel like it was appropriate to spend taxpayer dollars on those kinds of services. They felt like those could actually serve as quasi-enterprise or enterprise services so they could reinvest back into their own organization. So we're on a path to create a strategy for Sandy, Oregon. Um, things are going really well. Staff have been quite engaged. It's been a pleasure to work alongside all of them. Um, but this is where we're headed. So um, I'm going to go ahead and shut this uh, crazy slide deck off and um, open the floor for any comments, any thoughts that you may have. Certainly Rochelle, Tiana, um, John, any of the gang that's on, uh, uh, please feel free to contribute as you like. And um, again, I'm, I'm open uh, for any thoughts, comments, questions that the board has this evening. Well, I, I'll start off by saying I'm going very excited uh, to see this work moving forward. I have been uh, kind of around the park and rec profession for a number of years and have used to refer to it as a fee and cost of service study as opposed to, to the sustainability studies. It's uh, something that we've been looking at for a number of years in Oregon, um, generally speaking, but I don't think many agencies have had the opportunity to really dive into it or they haven't had the, I think better would be the, the courage to dive into it. I think there's a lot of agencies that are afraid of what they may find out. And I think that it becomes a common fear among some agencies that, or amongst maybe some directors, but what they're going to learn is that they won't be able to, or they fear they won't be able to provide the services that their community has come to expect. And they'll have to do a lot of explaining as to why suddenly there's a, a charge for that room over here to, to rent um, and what that real cost of that is, cost of that service is. And so I, th I think that it's that perception out there that that it almost is a a, a punishment uh, for the community. Um, I look at it as just the opposite of that. I think it's a gift to the community. And frankly, the way I look at it is, while it may be happening with with Parks and Rec and Sandy, by the time it's done, I believe it will spread across the entire city. I think that every department in Sandy, in Sandy will want to do this. I said, I, I came most recently as in, in uh, before I retired as in Ashland. I saw it on your resume that you've done work in Ashland. But I said the same thing down there before I left. That we wanted to do this type of work, this type of study. We wanted to, to make sure that we provided the best bang for the buck for the community. We knew that um, our long-term sustainability would be sorely tested. My understanding is it has been down there. And I, I think that uh, my hope was that as the park department down there completed it, other departments would be um, encouraged to go through similar studies. And I, I absolutely think that that's the right thing to do as a government agency, not just in the parks department, but police departments or fire departments or planning departments or libraries or any other services that we're offering out there as a community. We owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our community to do this kind of work um, as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Alex or David, do you guys have anything to share? Nothing from me. Well, it's really exciting. So I'm glad we are started this work and like to see where we go. Keep going from here. Okay. And David? Um, it sounds great to me. So I don't have any input. 
Okay. Ryan, what do you have? You've been working with the committee? Yeah, I'm actually really looking forward to seeing what they come back with and like where they find the focuses. And I'm really excited to like see what, come, what comes with this. How we can like make sure we invest in the funds for the benefit of everyone and make sure that we're being wise about it. I've had the, the good fortune of having offline conversations with, with both John and, and Rochelle um, about this topic. Um, in fact, my conversations about this topic with Rochelle dating back a few years ago, I think we uh, started having some of these conversations uh, when you were with Oregon City. And it's, uh, you know, again, it's, I think it's something that's very exciting. I think that it's absolutely critical that we, we do this. I think that it's um, not just important, I think it's essential. And I think it will go a long ways in building trust with our community when they really understand what our costs are and how we're going about delivering services. They may not always agree with it. Believe me, they won't always agree with it. But at the very least, I believe they'll understand how we got to our prices as opposed to, to the old methods of, well, gee, that's going to be a nice field trip. And if we keep the price down, we'll fill it up. And yeah, maybe we're going to lose a little bit of money, but it will we'll always fill it up. And so now we can and say, well, this is what the cost is, and this is what we're doing, and this is what we need to do to make this pencil for us and, and break even. And I think that's the, the important part to it. Yeah, and I, I would like to just add, Jamie, thank you. This is, it's, um, someone told me one time that there's a high cost to being cheap. And I took, <laughs> I took that to heart and, um, one of the things that the, you know, some of the work that we had done in Oregon City, that um, eventual outcome was a policy, and um, it was it was it was hard to get there. There was a lot of eye opening conversations, and then as we took that through the Parks Board there to eventually to the Council um, for a policy, it it like um, Jamie had said, it removed some of the um, arbitrary decisions that we were making as a department and helped set the course and. We're such a young um, department in that parks is now you know under this department and we're talking about the future and program plans and so you know my thanks to jamie and the parks board for being part of this because when we start to look at the beneficiary of services um, it's actually it's a really fun exercise to philosophically have that conversation of where people feel some of those service categories lie in the continuum as far as what what is a benefit for an individual versus the common good and um jamie's really good at juggling all those different opinions and then having it magically appear on a continuum that um you know will be our guiding north star as we move forward with um cost recovery and expense management and, and revenue generation and, and setting goals so um, I just, I, yeah, Jamie, thank you for being here tonight and presenting and, and helping us learn about it. And so I thank you for your time because I know um, you're very busy. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Enjoyed the bit of a history lesson there, too. I, I started in the profession in 1982, and it was definitely a Wild West mentality of, <laughs> of uh, let's do this and let's charge this, and then figuring out what this really meant. And uh, oftentimes we worked from the middle out both ways. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot of rhyme or reason a lot of times. And there are more than one time I wish that we'd had <laughs> you know, kind of the bumpers on the on the bowling alley to, to keep us in line and keep people moving in the same direction. But uh, it's nice to see that the profession has um, moved along in a more sustainable manner than what it may have been. I think for young professionals and for new professionals just coming into the, the field, I think that it's going to be uh, extremely beneficial. And I like uh, work and work economics too. It's <laughs> a great term. Well, I appreciate your time and attention this evening. Uh, obviously, uh, we're we're excited to have the chance to work alongside uh, Rochelle and the entire gang, as well as all of you as representative community members. So, um, it's it's always refreshing to work alongside an organization that um, is committed to this kind of work. So, uh, we certainly, on behalf of our team, I want to thank all of you.
Um, I, Rochelle, just keep me posted. We've got uh, obviously some next steps here, but if you'd uh, be kind enough to just give me another moment, I'm gonna just share uh, a slide with you that I'll share with you what next steps are for all of us working alongside Sandy. Um, as I mentioned, uh, John was the lead on the service category uh, development team. Uh, he sent us that first draft on Friday. I'm hoping to have something back to him tomorrow with our comments and questions, but they're really solid first draft. So I anticipate we may go back and forth one or two times and that should be it. Um, we'll be scheduling that beneficiary of service work session with staff, as well as obviously then having that joint board council session with you and your colleagues on the council on November 21st. That's already on the books. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we've been um, working on the cost of service work, and that will continue uh, likely for the next four to six weeks, at which time when that uh, cost of service analysis wraps up, we'll be scheduling uh, a visit with Rochelle and the project team, and we'll reveal the results of that, um, and then uh, provide them some guiding principles and some thoughts relative to establishing their first set of goals. So these are our um, next steps in the process. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much again for your time. It's been a pleasure. Um, enjoy the rest of the evening and uh, good luck with the rest of your agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. We'll give her just a minute and then we'll go ahead and uh, get started with this discussion. Again, um, all we can do is talk a little bit tonight. Can't really do any motions, can't do any, you know, take any actions. Um, as a result of not having a quorum, but we can talk briefly about uh, the different things. At the very least, what we talked about can be captured and uh, memorialized in a memo, uh, possibly prepared by staff. Um, this is a way of letting people know what our thoughts are in the process. Why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce the topic and then we'll go through it. Okay, I'll uh, keep an eye out if you guys see. No, we're no, not finding the department that missed tonight. No, we didn't run into. Okay, what's the workshop show? Okay. All right, so tonight's topic is the Cascade Creek Apartment Subdivision. And this is actually the first time that this subject has been um, in front of the Parks Board. And the, dis the discussion will be um, fee and lieu versus parkland dedication and um, the discussing the option of a development agreement. So to let the group know where the property is or what the property is that we're talking about, it is the area that's directly north of Bornstead Park. So you can see Bornstead Park here, this area, that's outlined in red is the Cascade Creek um, subdivision. So some highlights, some highlights about the subdivision. Okay, so this is an apartment complex. There's approximately 74 units. Um, that is the latest update, um, having spoke to our um, development services director. Again, the future development is directly north of the Bornstead Park. And the existing park satisfies the proposed park system requirements. So what that means is in the master plan, and there will be a follow-up slide that will show you the proposed park system map that's in our Parks and Trails System Master Plan. So there, um, the Bornstead Park satisfies the level of service for that area. There is a Trail 44, which is a um, future trail that is listed in the Parks and Trails Master Plan. And in a memo from the development, development services director, the developer can satisfy the trail 44 that's listed in the master plan by constructing the sidewalk on east side of Village, um, Village Boulevard right away. So at this time, planning has not received a land use application. I did receive an update um, prior to this meeting that it sounds like the developer is um, close to submitting that land use application. Okay, so here's trail T44. This is Bornstead in the purple right here. 
And then you can see here, this is the proposed future trail running along um, Cascade Village Drive. This is the proposed park system map pulled directly out of the Parks and Trails Master Plan. And again, you can see here's Bornstead. NP6 is the closest park and it's a neighborhood park. So that's a future site. So again, you can see Bornstead satisfies the level of service for that area. And so just to run the math real quick for the group, the fee and loo calculations using 74 units times two persons per unit with the new updated acre per person of 0 0.0068, they would either dedicate one acre to us or they would pay the fee in lieu. And the fee in lieu of dedication for a single family dwelling unit, duplex or multifamily family dwelling unit, not in conjunction with a residential subdivision shall be paid at the time of building permit issuance for the, sub, the subject lot or parcel. So that's just um, educating everybody on when that fee in lieu is imposed. Okay, so um, at the um, um, council meeting a couple weeks ago, the SDC and Fian Lu conversation was before the council, and they um, did choose to raise the SDCs, with, which is option D, which was the 8,800 um, and some odd dollars for the full reimbursement over a period of 11 years. And they also um, Past resolution 2222, I think, that was the fee in lieu, raising it from the 241000 per acre to the assessed value of 869242 So the new payment in fee in lieu based on one acre would be approximately the 869242 So again, key considerations that will um, hopefully assist the Parks Board in the discussion is the existing Bornstead Park satisfies the proposed park system requirements. The developer would be constructing a sidewalk. There is a memo from the development services director that um, was in the full agenda packet that talked about how um, the nearest park would be that NP6 that we saw in the previous slide that satisfies the park um, level of service requirements. And that um, one of the options that the Parks Board could discuss is a um, development agreement where perhaps the department would work with the developer to potentially build basketball courts as an example where they could receive SDC credits. And th that would be a separate process from the fee and low um, conversation. But just so you, that's an option that we could look at. So staff recommendation. So staff recommends fee and lieu of park bond dedication due to the existing proximity of Bornstead Park. If the parks board is in agreement, staff recommends that the park board submit a memo to the planning division accepting fee and lieu of park bond dedication. And then I've just added the suggested motion language. Um, if that's the, um, the route the board wants to go, we don't have a form, so we probably can't do an official memo, but. Okay, so discussions and questions. And I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Don, if you want to facilitate the. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, and in doing that, I got a couple of real quick questions. Um, on the overhead that you showed us, the, the map of Warrenstead Park property, uh, it shows the, the Warrenstead Park outline in black. It shows the subject property in red. The space in between, is that a dedicated right of way. This one right here, this map? Yeah. Okay, so you're speaking of this space here? Nope, that one to the right. Oh, up, up, down, 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 down. down, down, down. down, down. down. Little in between strip. Right there. Yeah, that's so so is that a, a street right of way? Do we know? I think, you know, I hate to answer this incorrectly, but I believe at one point there was supposed to be a street that was going to run to you. Supposed to be and the street right of way are two different things. Okay. So if it's a street right of way, then my question becomes um, will that be abandoned? And if it's abandoned, typically what happens is on a property line issue, half comes from one property, half comes from the other property, you create this street right of way. Mm -hmm. That land should get diverted back to the property owner. So, Warren said, part is a 54 right of way, we get 25 feet. 
along the, the length of the, the part there and the property down to 25 feet. So I guess my first question is, is that an actual street right of mine? Okay. And I don't know the answer and I can follow up. Yeah, I, I wouldn't expect to necessarily know the answer on that one. Um, secondly, have you had the opportunity or have you taken the opportunity to, to review the master plan for Bornstead Park? Yes. Okay, so as I recall, it does talk about uh, a couple of things needing to be added. One, to the south of the sidewalk, um, it runs along the edge of the playground is where the basketball pad is supposed to be. On the other side of that sidewalk, I think there's supposed to be a parking lot. Um, there's a like a grassy knoll someplace in case a resident drives by. Right, exactly. Um, and then in the playground, there's an obvious space for a tot lot that was never built. That if you look at the playground, you'll see a big lump sticking off the bottom of it. I believe that that was supposed to be a tot lot at one time, but um, not positive about that. My thought is if there was any way of doing any kind of a, a development agreement to see if we couldn't get that included within a tot lot and then also um, the basketball pad. I know there was a question about restrooms. I don't recall if restrooms were necessarily included in the master plan. Um, they are very much needed in that park. <laughs> Bornstead Park doesn't have restrooms? No, it has a porta potty. Oh. I thought they were part of the master plan. I yeah. I always thought that, and the, there's a house in the middle of it. Yes. And I always thought that it's supposed to become like a community center. And I always thought it'd be nice to take the garage, convert those into restaurants. It could be accessed from either inside the house or from outside in the park. Um, somewhere down the line in the, the future. And if the future is now, that would be, a, I think, probably a, the best use of. <laughs> Of resources we can think of for that part. Isn't That's that part house of... rented out though? No, not currently. Not really. Vacant. Vacant right now. We're doing some um, updates to it and some maintenance, and then it'll it should be online here within the month to be re rented. Right. Yeah. And well, then but... my next question is single. Where did we get our numbers for single family homes? Because typically those are, are rated for four occupants, um, not two. So where did where did we get those numbers at? So in the in the code, because these are um, apartments, it's uh, multi consider multifamily. So it's actually two for the multiplier. And then single family listed under the code for fee and lieu is actually three. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mom, dad, and one kid. Okay. Yeah. Now, the, the new SDC charges don't go into effect until January 1st. Mm -hmm. However, the fee and lieu is in effect now. Mm -hmm. And if we collect fee and lieu, we have the ability to spend that anywhere within the park system, correct? Right. And, that, and that's $816,000 just for that one complex? Yes. Yeah, close, close, David, 869,000. So. 69. Mm -hmm. What did I say? 16, I thought. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So we got so the just once you get into the 800s, I mean, the rest of it's just pocket change. <laughs> <laughs> Walking around when you're right there. <laughs> you, caught, you caught me. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What, what's your other question? Uh, that's it. That's all I got. Alex, what do you got? I don't think I have much more. I'm just thinking. <laughs> hey, what are your thoughts? Oh, oh, no, sorry. I just, I think it makes sense to obviously accept the fee and lieu. I mean, porn stuff's right there. Doesn't, doesn't seem feasible to, to have a, you know, land instead of. So it's kind of where my head's at at the moment. Not going to lie. I wish there was not apartments going in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was over for single family. So hectic, so hectic around that park. And uh, I liked your question about the roads because 
that can affect, you know, where we are because there's only like two roads in this way, and then there's one road off of two 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 eleven or something. Well, it's yeah. yeah, it's awful. So no, just I, uh, chaos. I I I will interject with one thing with that being apartments. I mean, we need to maybe find some way to create a maintenance budget for the splash pad. Because, I mean, I know what the code says about there being two people, but apartments never bring the proper amount of tenants. And I, and I feel that the splash pad is going to get a lot more use and a lot more abuse than It'll in its current years. It'll be oh, yeah. families instead of just two single people living in a Exactly. I mean, like I said, I know what the code says, but there's, there's no way that that's legitimate. Well, all those kids that are going to live over there will have cousins. So they'll all come play. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. That's exciting and fun. No, right. I, and I'm That's not saying there isn't. I'm just saying that that means it's going to get a lot more use and a lot more abuse. And we need to be able to have the funds to fix it and and restore it if that's the case. Yeah. I think the, the other thing that is of interest to me, if you go down and take a look at the site plan, the proposed site plan it was in here someplace. Um, yeah, here oh, it is on page, what page that is? This is page 41 of the master plan. If you, if you take a look at page 41, no, not on the, on the proposed uh, units, the oh, parts. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry. I'm sharing the wrong. I got all excited to have the master plan up. Yeah. The <laughs> Sorry. I was going to yeah, say no, that looks like a nice baseball diamond right there on that right hand side. Oh, you see it? I, I did, yes. The grass field. For sure. Okay, which one? This this is this uh, slide you wanted? No, uh, it's down from there. It's the one submitted by the development. It's the actual site plan. Um, it looks, oh, I think it was the first. Oh, yeah. and that's on the agenda packet. Okay, let me go. Yeah, ahead. it looks like this. Yes, the main. Okay, so I have to get into the agenda packet. I take me a second. So while, while Rochelle is looking for it, if you, when she does find it, if you look, there's like two segments to the park. There's a north and a south with a, a boulevard that kind of bisects it. If you go down to the um, on both the north and the south. Um, the north is a little bit smaller than the, the south, but it still shows a rather significant looking play area. And then if you go down to the south end, you'll see another play area, uh, maybe a little bit smaller in size, but then you'll also see grass field um, all adjacent to Bornstead Park. My um hope oh, is that maybe we can work with the developer to put some of that uh to public use um as part of that development agreement again that could be a way of you know by offset of sdc's possibly to help them out help them meet their needs but also help us meet our needs is this what you were looking for, Don? That's what I was looking for, yeah. So if you go to the bottom one over there on the right-hand side, it's just labeled as grass field. And if you think about Hornstead Park, you know, that's not that many feet north of the existing park. So if, if it is a street right-of-way, then uh, sidewalks on either side of that street right-of-way. And then the kind of the buffer area into Bornstead Park, it starts to become a relatively significant size of, of uh, property. I'm not sure, you know, what the dimensions are there, but, you know, maybe it could accommodate a, a small sports field for kids. Well, typically with the picture that I'm seeing where it says grass field, that, that typically usually is used for some kind of drainage or something. Possibly, or possibly not. Or is Bornstead Park in regards to this? Oh, yeah. It'll be right down adjacent below. Oh, I see. No, thank you. 
So where Maybe. where are the apartments going in? Are, are those the big squares? Yeah, I think they're the big uh, heavy bolted squares. And it looks like they're uh, yeah, like three floors per per building, maybe. And that's only seventy four units. That's a heck of a lot of parking spaces, but I'd rather they have a little too much parking than not enough. It seems like that's those pictures. If you're talking about three floors and then two two units per floor, that seems like a lot more than seventy four units. Yeah, I, I have no idea. The other thing that, that uh, I found interesting in the development code, it mentions that it has to be um, retail or commercial on the bottom floor. Yeah, I can ask. I can ask those of Kelly. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be curious about that. Um, the other thing that I'm interested in is. Village Boulevard itself. I know that they're required to do, I think it's a three quarter street improvements, which really surprised me. Usually it's like half street improvements, but maybe I read that wrong. And then that would take it down to Bull Street, down to Bornstead Park itself, which drops down into like No Street. Um, Yet we're going to be one day liable for that half street improvement to connect the two parts of uh, Village Boulevard. And I, again, I was wondering about utilizing SDCs or SDC credits um, and mobilization, having them mobilize when they're building this. If there's any way of tapping into that, to get our half street improvements over with. Um, but at a cheaper rate. So can we negotiate that or do we have to stick by what the SDC is? I mean, or can we say we're only going to charge you 85% of, of it? I mean, is that even in our power to negotiate? If we go within a, a development agreement, yes, we have the ability. We can't negotiate up the SDC, but we can negotiate things in lieu of the SDC. And it needs to be uh, logically similar expenditure, but and, and you know, that, that's I guess that's the part that I'm having a hard time seeing is even that grass field there is not going to equal land of of usable um, usable land. I mean, there, there's no way they'd leave an acre of land just as a grass field when you know they could build a whole nother eight units there. Right, but if we combined it with our properties. Do we have property in that area? Yeah, right. Adjacent to it is Bornstead Park. Yeah. Oh, okay. But that, but we don't know if that's going to be a road though eventually, because that's right there by. Right, which goes back to my first question: of, is that a right of way, an existing right of way, or not? Yeah. And if it's not, then we will hopefully be able to capture part of that ourselves, and they will be able to capture part of that, and create more space there. If it is a road, know. if it is a road, then ultimately we will probably be responsible for half street improvements on that road, which will be pretty spending. Yeah. I I think our best, personally, our best course is, is like having this discussion, giving a little information, which provides information for Rochelle. We can't officially do that, but. She hears our discussion and I see she's taking copious notes. I was I was gonna say we definitely want to make sure if that's gonna if that's still going to be a, a, a maybe a right of way before we even talk about um asking him for that little chunk of uh property because I mean yeah. if that is gonna be a right of way, then that little chunk of property is gonna be completely useless to us. Yes. But if it's not, it might not be useless. Well, those are just a few questions that I would, would hope that we would be able to. And typically, in the past, we've seen these things kind of um, migrate a little bit over time. Um, sometimes the developer will look for initial feedback in their earliest uh, pre-op meeting. 
and then uh, you know get some questions asked and answered, but come back for an additional pre-application meeting where they can refine the plan a little bit, then we can have a little bit better information to give them and a few questions of our own that need to be answered before we can help. See if we can uh, do a development agreement there. I think that's probably going to be the next step in the process. I would hope. The other thing I'm pleased to see also in here is that there, it does appear that they've accommodated uh, access into the park via foot. Um, if you look across the, the bottom of their site plan, there's. Well, I, I'm looking at a Google Maps picture of this development area. What What is, they have a, a road there called Pine Street. Are they planning on making a road all the way around this that butts up against Bornstead Park Row? At one time, that was in the neighborhood plan. Um, no, I know. That, what I'm talking about is in the developer's picture. He has a road that's called Pine Street. Yes. And there is no Pine Street over there right now. No, there is a Pine Street. It, it doesn't go north that far. Uh, if you go on Redwood, um, you can turn right on Pine or left on Pine or drive straight into the park, into the house's driveway. Oh, I see it. Okay. Oh, Pine Street turns into Cascadia Village Drive. Three houses. Yeah, there's like three houses up to the to the north on Pine Street from Redwood. So are they planning on can yeah, cause so yeah, so I, I see it because it turns according to Google Maps, it Pine Street turns into Cascadia Village Drive. Yeah. So are they are they planning on changing Cascadia Village Drive to name it Pine Street? No, it'd just be that section. Welcome to the world of development, David. Okay. Interesting. I guess Cascadia Village Drive sounds more highfalutin than Pine Street. I know I was excited when I saw it drive. I did receive an email from Megan who was trying to jump on, and she summarized what her point was in an email. Would you like me to read it? Yeah, please. Sure. Okay. Um, basically, we're just hoping for the option of four fee and low, especially given the existence of the Bornstead, Bornstead Park directly to the south. That was so she's looking for an uh, exception on our fee and low, which I don't think we're prepared for have the capability to do. Um, I, th I think she's hoping that the board takes the fee and low versus the park. Oh, yes. I yes. see what you're saying. I thought you were asking for relief. No, no, no. Okay. No. Yes. I, is, is that uh, David and Alex? How do you feel about that? Accepting the fee and load. I'm good with that. The eight hundred sixty-nine thousand. I'm on the fence, but I'm gonna go with I'm good with it. I'm on the okay. fence simply because it's apartments and not housing. Yeah. Um, and only because of the amount of extra use that the Bornstead Park's gonna get use and abuse. Um, I'm, I'm all about parks being used, but I don't think we have a good enough maintenance and um, uh, repair plan in motion for the amount of people that are going to start using this park when that many units go in next door. I mean, it's already a hot topic every summer, you know, about people cleaning up after themselves and, and stuff like that on social media. I just... I have concerns. Yeah. Alex, how do you feel? Yeah, I mean, David made all the points that I'm thinking. Um, I say, yes, we accept that. But again, I think there, he makes a point of like, what's the long-term care for the park, essentially. So it has yeah. been trashed before and unfortunately that doesn't look good. Unfortunately, we don't always have the authority. We don't have the authority to right. you know, tell a private property owner that they can only build houses. I wish it was. <laughs> yep. But it's we not. Apartments were coming eventually to Sandy. <laughs> That's right. What was that? I said, I, I feel like we already knew apartments were going to keep growing uh, in Sandy. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's, it's they, a little closer to home, you know? <laughs> they found us. Yeah, they did. Dang it. <laughs> Ryan, what do you think? Um, I kind of agree with Dave a little bit on like the on the on the fence a little bit, but I I think the uh, theme move instead um, is probably the best because of Washington well, Park being there, but making sure that it is going to be taken care of because it will probably see a high influx of um, kids. Yeah, and like well, and they'll it. love it, but like let's make sure that they can live it for a long period of time. Yeah, they'll love it to that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Lori, do you have anything you'd like to share with us? No, I, I share all of your sentiments. So. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. But I do like where you're thinking about, uh, you know, possibly doing that development and then some of those amenities. It, it'd be nice. Yeah. It'd just it'd be a nice good. way of Great way to pay for it. getting something for. Yep. Hey, Lori, just yeah. remember with the more apartments that come in, that's more stairs you have to climb as a firefighter. <laughs> I'm not aware. I'm not aware of the optics. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> uh, Rochelle, did we give you enough information? I believe so. Just to summarize, um, it sounds like the consensus of the group here is supporting the fee lieu, which we would we'll put in a memo, and then also um, mentioning the possibility of um, a development agreement. And then I have been writing down a series of questions that I'll ask planning to make sure to get back. I'll distribute it to you. And we can send it out to the board, but I'll get those questions answered for you. Outstanding. Thank Great. you very much. Mm -hmm. All righty. Uh, let's see. We zoom back to my end here. Um, old business. Let's see any staff updates. What do you got for us, Ben? All right. You want to go first, John? I do. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm covering the uh, recreation and uh, senior services side of the staff updates. I think I'll start first with some good and some sad news. Great news is that we have interviews set tomorrow for a recreation coordinator. I'll give our other recreation coordinators some relief as we are planning some fun events like uh, Mountain Storm Basketball, um, a new holiday extravaganza, if you will, uh, coming up. And it's just takes a lot of time and we need this person. So it's gonna be awesome. The sad news is that Olga, who was our client services coordinator for the last seven years here, um, retired pretty suddenly and we wish her well. She's, uh, she's happy and healthy and she moved back with her family. It was just her time, but um, it leaves us short in that position, which is sad and also just leaves kind of like a hole in our heart. Cause if you knew Olga, she, uh, Heart three times the size that she needed. She had love to give for everyone, the city, um, us. And so she's missed. And just on the work side, we miss her as well. But that has already been, that job's already been posted and is on the city website. And yeah, the recreation side, we just finished our last summer event. That was a corn cross, which is a cycle cross race held at Leopold Farms. Around 300, 350 contestants were there. Uh, racing, uh, the kids race, there's different vendors. Uh, I got to go out. We had uh, a buddy filming with like a drone. You can see aerial footage into the actual corn maze of all the bikers going and hopefully we can post that to our website and to social soon. Um, fall classes have started. So our rec guide finally went out and this week's been really exciting to see like our center kind of hustling and busting a little more. So now we're not just serving seniors, we're kind of uh, like birth to senior age kids. We have a Toto Suntos class, which is like birth to three. We've got youth parkour with the local uh, D31 in here, like doing flips and car uh, parkour. We've got a mental health class that started this week and yoga. And so it's been fun to see kind of the community get back involved in the little center here. Kind of like the biggest thing we've been going on, on the recreation side lately is um, this new event we're trying to do around the holidays, which is take our parks <laughs> facilities that we currently have, like mining, which I think is kind of like the jewel of our park system, and turn it into a matching unit with the, the plaza when they light the tree and having mining also be lit. So talking about like the gazebo and the stage, the shelters, some of the trees, and kind of having that pathway loop around mining um, be lit up to have an experience where you can walk through and enjoy it. 
And then not only that, on the rec side, programming events there throughout the month of December. Kind of at the infancy stage of that, but really pushing forward. We've got five events um, kind of planned out roughly um, from getting pictures with like the Grinch in a petting zoo. Um, there's like a program with the, I can't remember the program in Boring, but they do like theater and dramatic readings, um, a multicultural event, a sister event to the longest day parkway on the winter solstice would do a shortest day walkway. So <laughs> kind of walking through the path and having different booths. And then the one I'm most excited for is like some sort of adult stroll that might have adult snacks, snacks, mm -hmm. like fun lemonades, nice. and things to enjoy. Um, maybe a photo booth, maybe some caroling that happens, mm -hmm. but kind of just to make sure even in the winter times that people know our parks are here and we're planning stuff for them. Uh, some really cool news on the senior side. I think the last update I gave you, we applied for a grant to do some work in our kitchen. We were awarded a grant to do some work in the kitchen. So that's a $25,000 grant that we were awarded and uh, I'm just waiting on their end to see what the next steps are. And then this month's been really fun. We've had like the majority of our events and trips for our seniors have been sold out. And yeah, it's just been, it's been good. I think that's it. Any questions? Good stuff, John. Um, uh, real quick, and then uh, Tiana, do you, is there anything you want to report on on the park side? Did I surprise you with that? <laughs> right there. Um, just, we are very near complete the process with hiring a new staff member. And so we should be bringing our new team member on here in the next two to three weeks, hopefully. And we are working with an irrigation consultant to help fine tune our irrigation all around the city to improve water conservation and just it'll help improve safety and the quality of care that we're giving to all of our parks. So that's all I have for right now. Hey, Tiana. Yes. Congratulations yes. on your completion yeah. of the leadership. Process. Thank you. Thank you all. I know it's not easy. I look forward to reading your IPM at some point. I will be talking to you next month about that. I can barely contain my <laughs> There's nothing better than integrated pest management. <laughs> Okay, and I will, I'll end with a few updates. Um, I know that I briefly touched on it during the presentation for Cascade Creek, but um, the Parks Board efforts and advocacy and support from the council, um, we were able to raise our SDCs in fee and lieu, which is um, really exciting news because it's directly going to benefit our park system as far as being able to reinvest back into the system, especially having a reimbursement fee. Um, as we've discovered through everything we've learned with SDCs, there's less restrictions surrounding that. So we can do things um, like fix fantasy forests and some different things that are much needed. The fee and lieu, which is great because it is also something where um, now we're receiving um, funds that pay for what property is worth, allowing us to potentially purchase land in the future, growing our work system. So um, thank you board for the advocacy and support and, and learning SDCs as we, uh, Went through that. And then um, this is exciting and preliminary. So uh, I wanted to announce that we had we wrote that grant for the Sandy Bluff um, shelters. We were moved on to the next stage where the um, Oregon Parks Recreation Department, it'll be reviewed by the commission and signed. And so for all intents and purposes, it looks like we are receiving those funds to build a few shelters at Sandy Bluff. And nice. so, yeah, so really exciting news. So we'll see some developments mm -hmm. there. Um, Tiana's working hard on trying to figure out how we're going to keep the mining bathrooms open um, for the season. So she's exploring options. That was one of the goals that we had talked about for some of the improvements at mining. One was the electrical updates, check, check. We've done that. The other one was exploring this option to host events in the winter that we can have that um, have those bathrooms open and available to the public. So, but not leave them open like all the time, right? No, we, we have been out for the things, right? Yeah, yeah, we should be working that like a lot of time. I think nice going through my head. Is that a free thought issue? I will, yes, and that's one of the things, right? A free thought issue, 
um, what does it look like to have a lock-in time system so it opens at a certain time? And um, Tiana was educating me that uh, we do have a timer system on there, but our patrons in the park are fairly um, good at locking those doors yes. open. Yeah, they're skilled. Mm -hmm. Skilled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's ways of defeating them, unfortunately. Yeah. But we're looking into it. Um, and then that. Oh, and then the last thing too, and I can't, and I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but in um, August, I'm not sure I talked about this during the parks tour, but um, the community campus, the decision was to parcel off the park improvement. And so that RFP, I'm working on that, that'll be out end of October, beginning of November. I am meeting with um, various skate park and pump track um, uh, vendors who are um, working hard to hear the city's business and they have some really fancy looking parks and things to show us. So um, that's exciting. And then um, meeting and talking to um, various landscape architects about melding those processes and what that looks like to make sure that we have um, the best RFP that's out there that combines all of those together. So the project timeline at this point is we're hoping to break ground sometime in early 2024 based on just taking it from a concept to design development, construction drawings, and so, yeah, but we're moving on it. And so we're doing some really exciting things in the parks department. Good. Yeah. And with that, I'll quit talking. Well, with that, since we never called the meeting to order, we cannot adjourn. <laughs> so I'm gonna go have a beer. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you everyone online. Goodbye. Good night. 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 Good night.